Okay, so my name is Chloe Beckford, and I am Welcome Center. Can you hear her? Welcome Center Coordinator at Glenman Student Recruitment. And that job title probably doesn't mean anything to anyone, but basically from day to day, I help students with their admissions questions. I can also be sometimes an advisor, or a counselor, a psychiatrist, <laughs> and um, I just basically assist with the duties of running the office and occasionally help with um, copywriting and translating press releases for Glenman. Hey, Diana. My name is Diana Gregor, and I work in asset-based lending at RBC Capital Markets. I've been working there for about a year and a half now, uh, and in my role, it's a finance role, and um, I have a portfolio of about 20 accounts, and most of them are actually located in Quebec, uh, which means that I, I need to be bilingual for my role. Um, and uh, my role really allows me to just communicate and conduct analysis in French. Bonjour, je suis uh, Didier Pomerleau. Depuis 2009, uh, je suis le directeur exécutif de la planification stratégique pour notre faculté, qui est la faculté des, uh, des, des, des sciences humaines et études professionnelles. C'est la faculté principale de l'Université York qui représente à peu près la moitié des, des effectifs étudiants. Alors, qu'est-ce que je fais comme uh, directeur de planif stratégique? Uh, Évidemment, la planification stratégique elle-même, mais aussi la planification des ressources humaines, la planification des ressources financières, la planification des ressources spatiales, autrement dit l'aménagement de l'espace euh, dans la faculté, euh, différentes analyses financières, des analyses euh, politiques et des projets spéciaux divers. Alors, peut-être que, peut que pour les personnes qui ont quitté York avant 2009, oui. Euh, elles ne connaissent pas euh, la nouvelle la faculté. Ah, oui, oui. En fait, cette faculté, c'est la fusion de deux anciennes facultés, l'ancienne faculté des arts et la faculté de, de Atkinson. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, my name is Melissa Shin. I'm the managing editor at Advisor Group, uh, which is a division of Rogers Publishing. So I'm a journalist and I report on financial topics for financial advisors across Canada. And uh, we have a sister publication called Conseiller.ca and they uh, are located in Montreal. So part of my role currently involves uh, sometimes translating articles, um, helping them understand uh, what's happening in the rest of Canada and translating it for a Quebec audience. My name is Katarzyna Tarnowska, and I am a language assessor at the YMCA with the Newcomer, uh, Newcomer Programs. It's Language Assessment and Referral Center. Um, we do language assessment for Link Click program, which is a federally sponsored program, language learning <coughs> program for newcomers to Canada. So those new immigrants who need to learn English or French um, before they can go to class, they need to come to our center for an assessment, and then we in class. So we do French and English, I enjoy with English assessment. Bonjour, uh, my name is Sophia Dacry. I graduated from Glendon in 2007 with a degree in International Studies and French Studies. I work full-time for BMO Financial Group. I'm also doing my Master's in Education right now. Um, and I, know I work full-time at BMO, but I actually just returned from working at UNESCO in Paris. Um, in their section for literacy and non-formal education. So that's also another interest of mine that you'll hear about later. So I graduated in 2007 from Glendon and I always had an interest in anything international and knew that I wanted to pursue an international career and knew that one of the only ways to do so was to maintain the French language and possibly learn more. And by extension of knowing French, I learned Spanish. Um, so that has also facilitated my development and my career. French has been particularly useful in building my career and my foundation here in Canada. Um, it wasn't something that I expected to happen. It just really worked out well and I was able to continue um, through studying here and um, maintaining the language through courses and all of the professional activities that they had going on on campus. Um, and my first job out of university I actually got by networking at a conference that was offered at Glendon um, during my time there. And there was a woman who worked as one of the directors for a uh, federal government office. And she was there working on a project and explained how the project was going and I was really interested in that. So I got her card at the end of the conference and I sent her an email um, saying that I was interested and she emailed me back and said, 
you know, it sounds like you have a really great profile. Why don't you send me your resume? Because we've been trying to fill a bilingual position for a very long time and have no luck filling it. And I just happened to fit the profile that they were looking for, so that was my first job. Um, I worked at Canadian Heritage as the EA to the Director of Programs. Um, so that was how I started my development. And what was really great is because in networking with her, I had the chance to tell her what I wanted to do in my career. And fortunately, uh, the same department ended up hosting one of the only external events for UNESCO outside of Paris. And I was chosen as one of the li liaison officers for that event. So that eventually set me up to wanting to do work with UNESCO, which is always something that I had an interest in. And being in Paris, obviously French comes in handy. So that also helped me develop. Um, and having an interest in education was always something that I had. And so I actually came back to York in 2010 to do my B.Ed. And I now have a teaching degree as well in French as a second language and social sciences. And I do that on the side as a as I continue to have interest in that. Um, but in doing that, I realized that my long-term interest is in doing curriculum development and design um, at a level, at the international level or locally. Um, and that is also why I ended up working in Paris the way that I did. So all of the steps How that long kind did of- How spent in Paris? Six months. Yeah, so all of the steps that I started with and through networking and talking to the people about what I wanted to do, I, I don't think I was ever shy about telling people what my dreams were. And by doing it, they helped me realize them. So that was kind of a really great aspect of being able to talk to people about what I wanted to do. Um, and then and the from, the U, from UNESCO to? BMO, BMO, how that works, right. So BMO, um, I actually work for the Institute of Learning, which is their learning and development for all of their employees. And I work on a team that creates all courses related to ethics and legal compliance. Uh, so we create e-learning for 60,000 employees. And I'm on the writing team, so I write both in English and in French. Um, and also assist our learners in Quebec with questions that they might have or help that they might need in developing their learning and whatever else they need to do in terms of learning in their role. All right, good, all right, good. Uh, Katya? <laughs> um, well, uh, this is actually my first job out of school. And um, I started um, I drew my, my friend who graduated a year before me, and she was volunteering at the time, and she, they needed some more volunteers, and she asked me if I was interested. Uh, it was um, volunteering with the um, sort of conversation, conversation program for, for newcomers to Canada at one of the Toronto libraries. So I started volunteering, and then it, um, it was run through YMCA. And it turned out that the position of a language assessor was opening, and I was asked to send my resume because they knew I was looking for a job also. So I did, and, and it worked out. <laughs> so that was um, that's how that's how I started. Um, so how long were you a volunteer? Uh, I was actually not that long for about I think two or three months. It just so happened that the position was open, so uh, I was able to to find a job. Um, so um, I'm not really using my French <laughs> right now because I do assessment in English, but I could also, if my French were better, I could also do assessment in French. Okay. Um, so uh, I graduated from the Schulich School of Business in 2007 with an international uh, bachelor degree. And uh, throughout that time, part of the requirement for the program is that you have to take a second language, so I chose French. Um, a lot of my friends and peers got jobs as accountants, corporate lawyers, investment bankers. Um, that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I realized that I really enjoyed journalism. And uh, there was another classmate of mine knew about a magazine called Corporate Nights, uh, which is an environmental business magazine. And they were looking for someone to help research. Um, so I did some research for them, analyzing financial statements, really exciting stuff. And uh, after that was done, they were looking for someone to come on full time. Um, my boss at that magazine was very busy. Um, he had a lot of different uh, commitments outside of Toronto, outside of Canada in some cases. And so when opportunity was, would come up, um, because I was kind of his right-hand person at the time, uh, I ended up being able to take on a lot of those responsibilities. Uh, so the first sort of interesting thing that came up was an opportunity to appear on television, um, to appear on the agenda, TVO's agenda, talking about Earth Hour. And so they had asked him to do it, but because he wasn't available, 
they asked me to do it. And so I ended up doing it. They did it all in one take. It was in the dark. It was really weird. <laughs> and, um, and so that was sort of, I guess, the beginning of my confidence with being in the media. Um, my role there was as an editorial assistant, but very quickly they realized since I was going to be appearing in front of other people that they should give me a better job title. So eventually uh, it, I became the managing editor there and we did a lot of surveys and rankings of companies uh, across Canada as well as universities. And so that would involve often calling companies like SNC-Lavalin or uh, Université de whatever in, in Quebec and so they would always appreciate it when I could speak French and uh, you know speak in their language and then when the results of these rankings and surveys would come out uh, we wanted to hit the media across Canada to show what we had done and of course that meant being able to speak to uh, media in French and so nobody else on the team had that ability so I got put into the uh, role of speaking in French on CBC Radio. Um, I was on CBC Acadia, and I somehow also managed to be on television speaking in French. Um, they actually asked the questions in English, and they did not do it live because obviously I'm speaking English now. So it was a, uh, it was a bit of a challenge, but the fact that I had the ability to speak French was um, quite an asset that way. And uh, I was there at that magazine for four years. And, uh, and then after that, I moved to Rogers Publishing. Um, my boss was pleased that uh, I could speak French because we do have uh, our Quebec publication as well. I don't use it every day, but once in a while, there'll be a story that comes up that needs translating. Um, I'll admit I do use Google Translate, but I can tell if Google Translate is wrong, <laughs> so um, so that's good. And uh, sometimes it's it's always nice to call up a source in Quebec and be able to uh, speak a little bit of French with them, but then, of course, conduct the interview in English. So that's what I do. Uh, I've been in the workforce for a little longer. I'm the representative of Generation X on this panel, so uh, here goes. Um, in terms of my educational background, my main interest has been uh, management. Uh, so three of my degrees are in management. I did a Bachelor of Commerce and an MBA from the Molson School at Concordia. Uh, I then came to Toronto, uh, to York, and uh, one of the key factors of York is that it had a KFC at the time on campus. <laughs> Uh, that, that was uh, quite uh, an impressive point for me. Uh, so I did a PhD here at uh, the Schulich School and I also did a LLM at uh, Osgood uh, Hall. And uh, I also, uh, since I was already in Toronto, uh, did an MED in Educational Policy at uh, U of T's uh, OISE. And at some point, uh, I, I was uh, I decided to, to get a job. Uh, and uh, my f my first uh, non-teaching job was uh, Excalibur. Does anyone read Excalibur every week? Good for you. So I was the business manager there in charge of all non-editorial or non-journalistic uh, functions. Uh, along the way, I spent several years teaching part-time as a course instructor, uh, both at the Molson School and at the uh, Schulich School. I think I still have the record at the Molson School for being the youngest lecturer in their history, and they were founded in the 1930s. But I haven't checked if that record's been broken in the in recent years. Um, I then got hired in the Ontario Public Service, uh, where I was a civil servant for almost 10 years, uh, mostly working in the educational sector. I, I did a brief stint in social services at the Ministry of Community and Social Services, uh, but I did most of my work uh, at the elementary and post-secondary level. At elementary secondary, I worked in the education ministry. Uh, in the French language education branch and at the post-secondary level uh, I worked in what is now Treasury Board back then it was management board as the financial analyst for post-secondary and training uh, requests but I was also the backup analyst for elementary and secondary requests as well as children and youth services I then went to the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities where I worked in the colleges branch uh, in the finance unit of it uh, and then I went back to my old branch, French language education, uh, but as a manager. Uh, so over, over about eight years, I started as a junior analyst and gradually worked my way up to senior analyst and then team lead and then manager. And then the call of York uh, came back and, and after a while I returned to York uh, in my current capacity. 
in terms of the second question, how did I become interested in my main uh, two main passions, which are uh, strategic planning and educational administration? Because there is there's a sort of educational theme in my career. Uh, I was an instructor in the classroom. Obviously, I was a student many times over. Uh, I was also a system administrator at the system level in the government, and now I'm in the, an institutional level uh, administrator uh, at York. So there, there's an educational administrative theme in my career. Uh, there's also a strategic planning theme, and that interest was also uh, there right from the early start. Uh, as an undergrad in the, in the Bachelor of Commerce, my favorite topic was management and strategic planning. Uh, I f at the MBA level, it was also my favorite topic. Uh, my teachers said, you should do a PhD in it, you seem to be good at it, so that's what I did. Uh, and uh, when, when there was a, an opening here in strategic planning, I applied. So there, there was no sort of major sort of U-turn in terms of strategic planning. It was always there, and this is the gradual uh, evolution of my interest uh, in, in the subject. Uh, there were a few pivot moments in terms of how I, I, I came about uh, in terms of my, my career. Um, one was as I was finishing up my, my, PA, uh, my, my MBA, uh, the department chair at the time was one of my instructors. He said, you know, we should hire you. We, you should you should come and teach. And I hadn't thought of it at that time, uh, but it was it was wonderful because I was it was near the end of my studies. I was getting stressed about finding a job, and there you go. Uh, I became a teacher, enjoyed it, and I guess that's where I acquired the my my lifelong interest in educational uh, systems and educational administration and teaching in general and making the job of teachers easier. Um, another pivot moment, I think, was when there was a reorganization in training colleges and universities. Uh, I was uh, working there on the financial side of the shop, uh, but the reorganization was, and, and I had a long-term interest in post-secondary education, more than elementary secondary education. But most of the French language uh, educational programming was at the school board level. Uh, elementary, secondary, in other words. But with the reorganization of the ministry, now suddenly there was, there was a, a unit uh, responsible solely for promoting post-secondary and training uh, aspects of French language education. So to me it was the, the, the merger of two big interest strands and I applied for it uh, and got the job and had a really good time for a couple of years until I came to York. <laughs> well, no, no. Now that I've come to York, I still have a good time, but you know what I mean. Um, <coughs> dernièrement, sur l'importance du français, uh, le français était un, un élément crucial de ma carrière. Uh, à peu près la moitié de mes huit années en fonction publique, j'ai œuvré en, dans un contexte uh, francophone où le, le, la langue de travail était le français. Uh, C'est sûr que c'était des postes désignés bilingues, alors il faut quand même comprendre l'anglais, mais c'était principalement des postes uh, en français, uh, où les dossiers étaient la gestion des programmes d'éducation en langue française, uh, que ce soit, soit au niveau primaire, secondaire ou au niveau collège et université. Uh, un autre aspect que, que j'aimerais que, que remarquer en termes de l'importance du français, particulièrement si vous travaillez dans le, le, le secteur public, uh, le grand public, pas nécessairement juste la fonction uh, publique, mais uh, tout organisme uh, uh, public ou qui est financé par uh, les, les, les impôts uh, et qui doit être ré répondre aux langues officielles, il y a toujours un, un, une, une grande demande pour des, des postes uh, bilingues et des gens qui sont capables de, de combler ces postes bilingues-là. Alors, moi, j'ai été dans des comités d'embauche. Uh, il y a des concours où c'est juste un poste désigné anglais on va avoir quelques centaines d'applications. Pour les postes désignés bilingues, on a juste quelques douzaines d'applications. Alors, il y a beaucoup moins d'applicants. De, 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 euh, alors, c'est un... Il y a beaucoup plus d'opportunités comparativement euh, si vous aviez un outillage lang langagé comme le français dans euh, l'arène publique. Euh, en termes de, de mes activités extracurriculaires ou, ou, ou paraprofessionnelles, euh, le français était quand même très utile comme outil aussi. Euh, j'ai passé plusieurs années comme euh, sur, sur le, le, le conseil administratif du Centre francophone de Toronto où j'ai fait plein de contacts, plein d'amis. C'est une manière de redonner à la communauté. Euh, alors, il y, a toutes sortes, il y a toute une communauté euh, institutionnelle qui existe euh, dans le secteur francophone en, à, à Toronto. 
et du côté privé, euh, je suis aussi sur le, le conseil administratif d'une compagnie privée euh, qui, dont, dont les actions sont échangées sur la bourse euh, Toronto TSX Venture, euh, où notre projet principal dans l'exploration minière est au, est au Québec. Alors, c'était très utile d'avoir un membre du CA qui, qui parle français au début, maintenant on en a, on, 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 on en a euh, cueilli plus, euh, particulièrement quand on avait des interlocuteurs francophones seulement au Québec euh, et où on avait affaire avec euh, le ministère des, des Ressources naturelles québécoises. Alors, ça m'a servi aussi du, sur le côté privé, en ajout du côté public. Well, I graduated from the Schuller School of Business in 2010 uh, from the IBBA program. Um, I've always really loved the French language and I've been studying it since I was in kindergarten. Uh, and it's something that's always been very important to me. However, I wanted to pursue a career in business um, and I wanted to pursue a career in finance. And to be perfectly honest, I never thought that there would be opportunities for me to use um, the French language in finance in Toronto. Um, upon graduating, I applied for a position at Monero Solutions and it was a bilingual um, credit analyst position and uh, I was fortunate enough to get it and uh, in this role I was responsible for determining the credit worthiness of uh, clients across Canada but primarily in Quebec because there were only a few of us who were actually bilingual. Um, I, within six months I was promoted uh, to commercial credit analyst but um, within uh, Moneris. Uh, but I was looking at uh, the Western region. So at that point in time, for those six months that I worked there, I didn't get to use French. Um, after working at Moneris, I, well, when working at Moneris, I realized that I was ready for a new challenge um, and I wanted more responsibility. And I had always kind of dreamed to, that I'd be working at a bank somewhere downtown. Uh, so I decided to apply to uh, RBC and the Asset Based Lending Group. The position came up and I remember the description and I felt that I had all the qualification, all the skills required for it. Um, and at the bottom it said French language and asset. Uh, and you know, that, that really put my foot in the door. What's the saying? Put my foot in the door? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, because from my understanding there were not too many people who applied who were actually fluent in French. Um, so I was, a, I was fortunate enough to get that position. I've been working there for a year and a half now uh, and I've been really enjoying it and uh, in my role now I'm, you know, constantly speaking to clients in Quebec. I'm analyzing financial statements in French. Um, a huge chunk or a huge portion of my responsibilities now um, are in French and making sure that our Quebec clients um, are, are well taken care of. Um, in regards to the importance of French, um, like I had said, I, ha I never realized that I would have the opportunity to use this language that I love uh, to do uh, to, to work in business and finance in Toronto. So are, is anyone studying business here? Is anyone? Yeah? Okay. So if French is something that you'd be interested in doing, um, I know for a fact, for example, that uh, we were hiring not too long ago uh, and I had a friend who uh, I had recommended who doesn't speak French and he was more than qualified for the position. They interviewed him, they loved him until they decided that they want someone who speaks French and that was mandatory. So all of the people who might have been good candidates no longer applied, right? And it's it's uh, it's honestly very tough to find someone who, um, you know, has a business degree, is in finance, and is fluent uh, enough in French that they can actually speak to um, our clients in Quebec. So that's the importance of French. Uh, it is possible to uh, to use it in finance in the business world in Toronto. So, did I answer all your questions? Okay. Wow. okay. <laughs> Okay, so I graduated from Glendon with a degree in translation, a French-English translation, and I've always loved French. I knew that whatever I wanted to do it was going to be in French. And I worked with the student recruitment office my entire four years as a student, got to um, work with really great organizations like French for the Future, Canadian Parents for French, and speak on the importance of bilingualism in Canada. And then at the end of my four years when I graduated, I thought that was the end of my work with student recruitment. They threw me a party, there was chocolate cakes. So I was like, okay, so it's <laughs> over. And then at the end of a three month trip in South America, I got an email from my f former boss at student recruitment saying that they really desperately needed someone. And I was really afraid I'd lost out because I'd had a week of no internet access. And fortunately enough, they still hadn't been able to find anyone in that time. So I was able to um, actually have a job. 
came back from South America, which was really great because I had no money. And um, so I've been working there ever since. And French is really um, essential in the job because you're speaking to future students internationally across Canada. I use French, I would say, 70% of the day um, when speaking to students. And then half of the employees in our office are francophone. So I really get that opportunity to use French when interacting with them. Diana made, made a really good point that it is really tough to find people with the right skills that are um, that that are bilingual. Um, I'll just use an example actually that I heard yesterday. I was talking to a friend and she said that this may not be the best example, but she was talking to her friend. Uh, I was talking to a friend and she had a employee at her uh, job that was performing not so well and I said oh why don't they fire her it's because she's bilingual and we need we need a bilingual person so um, I mean that's not my career advice to you but as you can see it sort of demonstrates how difficult it is and, and she works in Toronto um, what I would say is if you are looking for a position that is going to use French look at companies that conduct business across Canada so um, you know for example I'm with Rogers publishing and then we have uh, the the French uh, version as well in Montreal um, I mentioned earlier SNC Lavalin, they're French as well. Um, there's actually quite a few Quebec companies like uh, Canadian um, National Rail. Um, there's uh, several others, if, if you take a look, that are headquartered in Montreal or somewhere else in Quebec. Um, a lot of the resource companies, um, which DDA mentioned as well. Um, there's a lot of business going on in Quebec and uh, because of, you know, a lot of the government um, tax incentives and that sort of thing. So I would definitely say that if your company conducts business across Canada, that there is a higher chance that uh, French will be an asset. It may not even be listed on the job description. For example, for the job that I have now, it wasn't listed. Um, but I'm sure it helped me stand out from other candidates when they saw that it was on my resume. I can speak to that as well. Um, when I first started at BMO, um, I actually worked at Glendon at the time in student recruitment, and a colleague of mine knew that I wanted to work towards this curriculum development and um, working in an industry where I was kind of behind the scenes in the education, um, and she sent me the posting. And I had none of the skills that they were asking for, um, except for the French. So she said, you should apply because I know that's what you want. I was like, yeah, but I don't know anything that they need me to know, um, apart from maybe lesson planning, which I learned to do throughout my teaching career. Um, and so I ended up emailing them and they saw my resume and they said, we're actually doing interviews tomorrow. And if you can come in for an interview, that would be great. So I went in for an interview, and I think most of the questions that they asked me during the interview, I had to speak truthfully and say, I don't have the background <laughs> that you're looking for, but I can definitely do the French for you. No problem there. And so in the end, they ended up emailing me back saying that they had two candidates um, that they were choosing between. The other person had knowledge of French, but not the level that I had French at, but she had all of the instructional design background and I had none. Um, so ultimately, the second part of our interview was testing our French. And they, um, from what they told me, there was about four of them in a room, and I was over the phone. And they had sent me a storyboard, which is where we write the curriculum that we're going to display for our students. And they sent it to me in French and asked me over the phone to translate it. They sent it to me a minute before the conversation. And ultimately, that was what got me the job. And they were willing to take a chance on me and train me in the in the field because I had a skill that not very many people had and not many, very many people can learn. You know, you can learn a lot of other skills because they're a lot easier to learn by doing, but with French, if you have it and you um, can use it on a daily basis, and then people who don't, they can't learn it as quickly as they can other skills. So if you do have that passion for it from now and maintain it, it will make a huge difference when you're looking for jobs. I, I concur with I concur with the previous speakers. Uh, I think French is a huge asset uh, when it comes to getting a job at whatever level. If it's an entry level, if it's a senior level, if it's a mid level, uh, you're always going to have an edge uh, if you have that language tool. 
uh, in, in your toolkit. Uh, and that applies both to the public sector, whether it's the education sector, the health sector, law, uh, there, there's always demand, or the private sector, particularly if it's a firm that has a significant portion of its operations in a French language jurisdiction, or if it's, if it's serious about customer service and having customer service standards uh, for, for all of its uh, customer base. Well, um, so part of the IBBA program, as you had mentioned, uh, you need to take a language. Um, I had studied French throughout uh, elementary and secondary school, so I figured I'd, I had also started Spanish, so I figured I'd continue on with Spanish. Um, in my last years, I switched back to French, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have Professor Marjolet as my professor, and I definitely feel like I've, I've learned a lot. I think that it's, it's one thing to be able to say that you speak um, French and you can have a conversation in French. Uh, it's a different kind of thing to say that you're able to conduct business in French. Uh, and through the courses he taught, I was able to learn the required language uh, in terms of financial language or professional business language uh, required in these types of settings that I'm, I'm uh, currently in right now. So that's something that I, I thought was, um, was a huge advantage for me because, you know, starting the job, I actually understood what people were saying and it wasn't just random uh, jargon. But yes. I could, I could um, say something about that as well. Um, I also took full advantage of being on campus at Glendon. I think by the end of it, I did most of my degree, about 75% of my courses in French, not just French language courses, um, or you know, courses about teaching French as a second language, but also in my major. So I took a lot of international studies courses in French, and that helped me build the confidence to speak to different topics in French other than you know the textbook French that we learn so that was really interesting um, and then I was interested in business also as one of my um, streams and I took a course with um, um, Professor Marjolet at Trulic and that was something that I was able to do because my professors knew what my interests were um, and you know got a special form signed to be able to take it at Trulic and it was a great opportunity as well um, to build that confidence to use French in settings other than what we're accustomed to from taking it in high school and whatnot. And I think that's really important um, also to develop language and, and I picked up Spanish from having done French at school and use Spanish in my job as well. I work for a company part time in Spain and through that I communicate with them in Spanish and work regularly in Spanish as well. So one language leads to others and it helps a lot in developing skills that way. Yeah, um, just to touch on what you mentioned about uh, the special form thing. So um, I did my degree with Schulich, uh, and when I first started my French courses in first and second year, I, I realized I needed some extra help. And so the French department actually allowed me to, to audit kind of a French course. Uh, it was like a sort of, I guess, a in-service or like a... I don't, can't remember the word, but it's like when, when it's, it's just informal and we're all talking, it was kind of like a conversational, like it was for 45 minutes twice a week. Um, and that was really great. And, you know, people always complain about the bureaucracy at large institutions. Um, but it was really helpful that the French language department recognized that even though I wasn't under their jurisdiction, that I had an interest in learning French. And so they helped me do that. And so if you guys ever want to do things outside of your particular degree, and it has to do with French, from my own experience and yours as well, I think that um, the department's really happy to help you with that. Um, so for the ladies in business, I strongly recommend that you join Women in Capital Markets, uh, if you haven't already done so. Um, the, it's, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for networking. Uh, you join this club and you get involved, you get a, as much time as you have, uh, you can dedicate to them. It's nothing. Um, it's not a huge commitment unless you want it to be a big commitment. Um, and it's. I wish I would have joined Women in Capital Markets earlier on. Um, what the what the group does is really we put together events for students um, in order for them to learn more about the various areas of capital markets. And it's a wonderful learning opportunity for those who are interested. Um, and I've spent some time volunteering, but I only started when I was in my last year at Schulich. But I feel like I've met so many people that all of this would have been a lot more beneficial had it happened earlier on. So if someone's interested in business and they're a woman, then women in capital markets would be, uh, would be great to join. Um, sorry, I'll just add, I'll just add um, for me, when I was going through university, I always had the interest in teaching and I was always 
told or believed that I had to teach French to do anything with French in education. I didn't know that there was, was anything outside of just teaching when I wanted to use French. And I wish I had known that sooner because I would have started my master sooner and gotten to where I wanted to be sooner. So that's something to be mindful of is that there is no limit to what you can do within your sector or whatever your interests are. I'm speaking to education specifically because I always thought the only thing I could do was be a French teacher. Not that there's anything wrong with that because I enjoy that as well, but I didn't know that I could do anything beyond that. And that's something that's really important that you shouldn't feel restricted by your language and thinking that there's only specific things that you can do because you can do anything. And like you can see the panel here, we all come from such different environments, but we're all using the French in our jobs. Uh, one piece of advice that I would give uh, in terms of finishing faster maybe is to keep a, a, a smart control on your extracurriculars in terms of your involvement in student clubs, student politics, and so forth. You have to find the right balance. If you don't participate enough, in other words, if you just come to school for, for your classes and then go home, you're losing out on the ex educational experience. You're not getting as much out of the experience as you can get. On the other hand, if you, if you let yourself to be too deeply immersed into that world, uh, you'll end up taking longer uh, than you need. Uh, so find the right middle point. Uh, f certainly for me, uh, at the undergraduate level, I was part of the debating society of, of, of the university and, and I learned more in the debating club than any credit course I've ever taken. Mm -hmm. So find the right place uh, in your extracurriculars, but don't overdo it. Moderation is best. Um, so like you said, I do speak to applicants from all over the world, um, countries like Cameroon, Burundi, Côte d'Ivoire, um, France, Switzerland, Belgium and then um, people from Quebec, New Brunswick, even Manitoba, and all of those areas, they um, speak French, so I do have to be proficient in French when dealing with them. But also, occasionally, I really get cool tasks, um, such as, for example, like I mentioned before, translating press releases. So that was something that wasn't actually in, um, in my job description. But because I did translation and you know, they are now familiar with my abilities, occasionally, I do get really cool tasks like translating. So. Yeah. Um, occasionally it will happen that a client, a French speaking client will come for an assessment and then the, their English is not high enough to sort of have conversation and talk to them about in terms of what school they need, full time, part time, and things like that. Then one of us, French or some French, we will use so our French to, to talk to the client, to interpret. In your, in your job description, you do assessment in both French and English. Well, I do English assessment, but if there are clients who come from French-speaking countries, and perhaps they don't speak any English, some do, some don't. So in that case, later on when we do the referral for the school, we will need to, we need to communicate with them, so we will use our French. May I ask you why they want their language to be assessed? Oh, why, uh, well, <laughs> uh, this is for LINK CLICK program. LINK stands for Language Instruction for Newcomers to Canada, and CLICK is the French equivalent of that. So this is for um, new immigrants to Canada who come here and want to take either English or French classes. Here in Toronto, most of them are interested in English classes for obvious reasons, but there are some who they feel they speak English well enough and they want to take advantage of the French French stream. So they can do that also. They can choose one, either and French or English. The classes are free? The classes are free as long as you are a permanent resident or a conventional refugee. Anybody else? Um, so my job is very much uh, news oriented. So we run a website and two magazines. Uh, so one example from the other day is there was a uh, problem on the French website where there weren't enough people visiting it and so we had to uh, create something on our website where there were enough people visiting our website to send them to the French website. Um, so their best story uh, they sent to us and said you know put a little uh, summary of it up on your website and then send people to our website so we get the hits. Um, so I volunteered for that and I read the article and put a summary together and then you know send people to that so that involved me having to read the article understand what it was about 
um, create sort of a little bit of an English summary of it and then send people away and hope that they didn't get mad that it was a French article. <laughs> <laughs> Another example is um, Canadian press. You may have heard of it if you ever read the newspaper. They um, sort of, it's the Canadian newswire where things come through. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes the news releases come in French before they come in English. For example, it's something that happened in Quebec or for whatever reason the Quebec writer was faster. <laughs> um, so if it's something really important, I can read it um, and know right away, hey, this is really important, let's get on it. Um, and if I didn't have French, I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and the other interesting way that I think French has helped quite a bit is simply with being able to think on your feet and be confident. Again, I don't use French every day, uh, far from it, but knowing that I have it in my back pocket, and then of course that really awful feeling when you're trying to speak to someone in another language and they don't necessarily understand you, but you push through that. Speak and louder. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, just repeat it many times. Um, and uh, you know, you're trying to scramble and think about your French vocabulary and, and try to say something that they understand. That skill and that confidence and that ability to push through that um, really helps you with everything that you do in your career, um, your confidence to be able to speak to people in English, um, you know, your ability to think of solutions for difficult problems because your brain is used to thinking in many different directions. So there's that side benefit as well, for sure. Uh, this is the job actually currently that, that I've used French the least. Uh, I never use French formally and I, I will informally say hello and chit chat to other francophones on campus in French, but apart from that I don't use it. In all my previous jobs, however, I've used it. Uh, some of them I've used them, I've used French 95% of the day, uh, usually when I work in a, in a formal French milieu. Uh, sometimes I use French some of the time when I was working in, uh, as a financial analyst uh, and a financial manager. Uh, we would deal with in French with French language colleges, for example, or if there's a French letter from, from a student or a parent somewhere, people would come to me and say, could you handle that or you know, could you respond for them and so forth. Uh, so the jobs have ranged from having some French to having almost all French uh, to this one where there is no French, but so far it's been the, the statistical blip. Uh, one really great program that as a Glenn student maybe you've heard of is Explore. Yes. You have? Okay. So then um, I'll let everyone else know. Um, the Explore is a five-week program where you can go anywhere across Canada to um, really immerse yourself in the French language. So for those who haven't done it yet, it is a really great opportunity. And it's funded by the government, so you don't really pay for anything. So it's, it's a really great opportunity. And everyone who's done it has come back with their French level being infinitely improved, and you get university credits for it. Just to add to what Chloe said, um, the same program, uh, sorry, the same department that offers the Explore program also offers a program called the French Language Monitor program. I think they may have changed the name <coughs> recently. I believe it's called Odyssey now. Could be wrong, yes, okay. Um, it's been a while since I did it. Um, but that is also another great program. The advantage of that program is that you can actually do it while you're a student as well as after you actually, graduate. It exist Not at all. The funds have been cut. Oh, <laughs> sorry. And I didn't that was my was plug. Program. Yeah, it was, it was an awesome fantastic. program. Yeah. Okay, well, one of you could try and get that program. Yeah. Again. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that could be your job. Yeah, now that we have a new prime minister, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Explore is good, though. Great. <laughs> Explore is very good. If you want more information about Explore, you can always go to the French department or their website. Two, two words, pop culture. Uh, I learned English uh, not in school, although I did go to school, but everybody, all my other classmates were French and we just talked French to the, the, the frustration of our English teacher. Uh, so that wasn't happening. Uh, I learned English by watching Saturday morning comics. So Scooby-Doo, um, Super Friends, um, Bugs Bunny, <laughs> those were my tutors. Uh, and that's how I learned to, to, to speak English. Um, my mother, same way, although not with the cartoons, she, she learned speaking English by just watching English language soap operas uh, and Three's Company. Um, <laughs> so it, it works. So for you, you know, I would suggest watch French TV, turn on, you know, Channel 12, uh, you know, watch, watch what's happening, uh, rent French language DVDs, uh, use the subtitles as you, you try to familiar, familiarize yourself with the phonetics versus what's being said, uh, try out some books and uh, gradually brush up. Um, one suggestion would be perhaps going on exchange uh, to a French 
country. I was fortunate enough to go to HEC Paris, which is just outside of Paris, uh, and I was able to take uh, business courses in French as well. So I was in a, in a class full of uh, native French speakers, so I feel like my French significantly improved, well, because it had to, so yeah, that's a good opportunity. Depending what industry you're looking in, I know for a fact um, in finance, for example, I've seen uh, numerous postings that require you to be bilingual, but not necessarily bilingual with French. Uh, most of them are bilingual with French, um, taking into consideration that a lot of your business is done in Quebec. But uh, there are some of them that I've seen. You have to be, you have to speak uh, English and Mandarin or Cantonese, or you have to speak Spanish and English. So there's definitely a lot of opportunities if you do know other languages. But uh, it, it is a it is a tough job market. But if you can find any positions that uh, require you to bilingual, uh, to be bilingual, or French happens to be an asset, then I would definitely apply for them because you have a, a much larger chance of uh, of getting it. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of hiring uh, in my various positions, and what makes someone stand out is often the fact that they have concrete experience, even if it's not paid, and I'm not advocating getting unpaid internships, um, especially several in a row, uh, but the idea that if you have something that you're passionate about, um, for example, you love animals, and instead of going and volunteering at the SPCA, uh, you know, cleaning out... <laughs> The, the stall or whatever, um, you know, you could see, say, do you have a position on your board? I'm bilingual and, um, you know, if you need to ever liaise with the Quebec SPCA, um, then, you know, I can help you with that. Um, or if you need some help with communications. And so, yes, at that point it's, it's unpaid, but it's a volunteer position anyways. Whereas, and, and then that can help you, um, you know, get job experience that you won't necessarily get in your current role. Um, the other thing that's really important is something that um, combines, you mentioned sort of combining French with other things. I think that is really important, um, you know, unless the role is specifically French oriented. Um, important not to see a great attitude, and I know that that sounds um, sort of nebulous, but the idea, what I mentioned earlier about how knowing a, another language makes you think on your feet and come up with complex uh, solutions to, to problems, uh, if you can somehow turn the experience that you have with French, even if you apply for a job that doesn't involve French, but use that to your advantage and say, you know, these are the skills that I picked up when I've been learning French and learning another language. Uh, I think that that, in, and if you can use that um, and show concrete examples of it, I think that will be a huge advantage in explaining yourself better and showing what skills you already do have. Also yeah. to add to what Marissa just said, um, when you volunteer, you get to know people you get to network, so you get to make contact. So even if you not, don't necessarily find a position in this particular company, maybe you make contact with somebody who knows somebody, who knows somebody else. So it, it, my, in my opinion, it really helps. It, it did help me, so that's how I know. And make sure you tell people what you're interested in. I think um, before you can say, will this help me in my job, you have to know what job you're looking for. I've had a lot of people say, I'm looking for something. If you hear about it, let me know. It's like, what are you looking for? I, I can't help you. Whereas if someone says, I'm really interested in a job in magazine publishing, particularly in fashion, I can say, oh, that's great. I'll, I'll be able to help you. And as you say, people will tell people, will tell people, I know a really great person. And if you can demonstrate that you're valuable, um, and, and you can make a really good connection with someone, they'll want to help you. Just on that point, um, I know that my employers, they've, they always ask me to refer people I know who have studied finance and are bilingual in French. Yeah. And I can never come up with any names because the, the people that I do know that, who speak French have perhaps gone in other streams of, uh, of business. So it's definitely talk to people who you know. If you know someone who's in a position that might interest you, talk to them. Get get yourself, get your name out there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I was just going to add to all of the points that everyone's made, the importance of networking and taking volunteer positions. My position in Paris was unpaid, but I did it because I knew that that was my opportunity to get in the door and make the networks that I wanted to go back for a paid position. Um, another thing that's actually worked for me more recently and being a part of this generation that is um, fully aware of all the technologies available to you, um, I connected with a new initiative that I'm interested in now with someone over Twitter. 
Um, so, you know, look for people, follow people on Twitter, look for groups, online communities are just as good as face to face. Um, and that is also another way to build your network and kind of put your name out there. Um, I know that for this panel, um, Hema found myself and a few other panelists on LinkedIn. Um, and putting your name out there and just describing what your passions are is also another way. So if you're not the type of person that's comfortable, you know, making conversations, that online aspect can kind of get you a little bit out of your shell and then go to, you know, conferences or meetings or sessions or whatever it is that you feel that you're interested in going to and use that, have some business cards made up on the side and hand them out as, and that really, really does help a lot in addition to, you know, building the skill and the language. Just knowing a language, whether it's French, Spanish, Chinese, uh, Arabic, uh, you know, by itself will not get you a job unless it's an interpreter job or a job that's exclusively focused on language skills. Uh, basically, a language is a top up you have on some other talent base. So if you, you, you need that base to begin with. So if you're an architect, you'll have an advantage if you're an architect who speaks French versus an architect who doesn't, let's say. Uh, if, if you're uh, a lawyer we're trying to work, uh, trying to apply for to become a, a, an immigration and refugee commissioner, you'll have a serious advantage if you speak French, but you still need to be a lawyer to begin with mm -hmm. and so forth. So you need that basic foundation. French is the accelerant, not the, 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 the foundation itself. And just really, really quickly, um, one Advice, piece of advice that a professor gave me was to make my resume a skills-based resume because as a new grad you maybe don't have a lot of actual work experience so if you change your resume around so that you're highlighting your skills you can really sell yourself and you're not just based on, based on job titles. I, I just remembered um, last month I attended uh, York alumni meeting it was in December it's a yearly meeting and I remember talking to two people both of them mentioned that language gave them an advantage. One was French, one was Spanish. And I asked both of them, would you have got the job that you have if you didn't speak the language? And they both said no. So that's, I think that, that speaks to the importance of having another language. Also another example <laughs> of how networking will help you is um, a friend of my brother, of a friend of mine, went for an interview and um, it turned out that they actually didn't give him the position, or I don't remember the reasons. But the interviewer really liked him, and he said, well, I know somebody in another company in the same field. Let me put you in touch with him and you know, see if there is, they have something of them. And it worked out. He actually went to an interview to the other company and he got the job. So it was the interviewer who <laughs> he didn't find the job with the company that he interviewed for in the first place, but he found Oh, and one last thought. Uh, for the language to be an advantage, you have to have a certain level of proficiency in it. Uh, to, in, in my mind, there, there are three basic levels of proficiency. You have tourist level, where you, where you can basically ask where the washroom is and, and you'll pick something off the menu. Uh, yeah, you have, then you have business level where you're able to, to transact a, a deal basically in the language and read the newspapers. And then you have academic level where you're able to read sort of literature and poetry in that language and write in it and, and, and you know, read academic journals and things like that. So basically you need the middle level to, to really sort of establish yourself as credible in that language. You need the business level uh, proficiency. When I was in Kim Marshall Lee's class, um, he brought in <laughs> an expert who helped us translate our uh, CVs into Francais, which was great. I still have it somewhere. <laughs> so if I ever need to bust it out. <laughs> um, as a French to English translator, most of the organizations I'd be working with would be French organizations who have no English people working in their office. So for me uh, to apply to a job, I would need a French cover letter or, um, and resume, but it would depend on the job. Following up on that question, for example, uh, Safia, you said that you had a test, you yep. were tested. Mm -hmm. uh, how difficult are these tests, language tests, um, uh, 
for the job market? It depends on where the test is um, being given. So with when I did it with BMO, it was fairly informal. Like I said, they just sent me a document um, in French that I had to verbally translate in English. Um, when I worked for the federal government, um, there was a written proficiency, a comprehension proficiency, as well as a an oral proficiency. So it really kind of varies from industry to industry, company to company. Um, but it's not always that you have to have the exact same proficiency at all levels. So that's a lot of, a lot of people have that concern. It's like, you know, I'm really good at writing, but my oral isn't that great. So I might just not get the chance to have a job in that field. But that's not normally the case. They kind of vary the levels because there's certain jobs where you'll use your writing a lot more. There's other jobs where you'll speak a lot more. So it can vary, but um, a lot of the times you might be tested on all three levels. It doesn't mean that you have to be perfect at all three, but you have to have at least some knowledge of each. For my role at Moneris, um, someone just asked me a few questions in French just to kind of see what my level was. Um, and then at RBC, um, no one asked me anything in French. They just kind of asked me, you know, do you speak French? Where did you learn it? Just kind of asked me questions like that. And uh, I always joke around with my boss. I said, what, what would have happened if I said yes? And then I would have come in. You would have had me speak to a client in Quebec. And, you know, I wasn't good enough. But I saw that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, for the, they're actually looking to hire someone new. So for the new French, uh, for the people coming in, the candidates, uh, I, I got to interview them a bit in French. So that was exciting. I wouldn't have wanted this. But I know that some places that the profs just say like no English at all. And that would have really forced me to not rely on English as a crutch. Um, so I don't know that that one is, I'm, I'm on the fence about that. Um, the other thing is, is more um, like that, that in-service thing I was telling you about, like the 45 minutes every two, two days a week. Um, where students get together and there, it's a moderated, probably a TA is there and, and speaking French with you. Um, if that happened more often, I think that would be really helpful. We actually have that. Great. Uh, once <laughs> a week. And uh, I invite everybody to come. It's on Tuesdays, right? Tuesday afternoon. Yeah. Okay. From what time to what time? Oh, I think there's new times this semester, so I don't want to say the wrong one. Okay. But around lunch and early afternoon. But you can send me information. Yeah. All right. My second question, maybe. I think you d did a great job with uh, the French classes. Well, I took a much. short I don't so. want that to think that <laughs> <laughs> I invited you because <laughs> <laughs> only three of them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Any piece of advice for the profs? You were satisfied with your education? Chloe? Um, I also wanted to say that I did really enjoy um, my professors. I had one professor who was a really, really hard marker, and at the time, I would have liked another professor, but afterwards I realized the advantages of the fact that she didn't allow us to have a crutch either. So um, it was in a more advanced level of course, so we weren't allowed dictionaries or thesaurus or anything like that. So you were really um, forced to um, try to express yourself in different ways. And she didn't like repeating of expressions. So oh she, was, she was really, really good for forcing me to kind of think outside of the box. I think that's a hard question to ask us because at the time when we were students, we probably hated everything that we did. <laughs> but now that we look back, we're only where we are now because of the way we were taught and because of the things that our professors so thoughtfully put us through and all of that. And we don't realize it. And obviously now having an education background, I realize it too that I might put my, through, my students through stuff that they don't care for now. But I know later they're going to come back and think, you know, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be able to use my language or converse or whatever it is. So that, that's why I have a hard time answering because I enjoyed everything back then, probably not. But <laughs> now no, but I look an back and. Point, I mean, yeah. Because you're talking to parents. Yes. <laughs> you probably sometimes hate what they are doing or have to do, and they can see the benefits right. later. Yeah. 